Hello, everybody. And as promised, here we are. We got some stuff to talk about here today. <clears throat> now, I just want to say, I am so flipping excited about this video. And I'm actually super excited about this whole series um, that I'm going to be doing. Um, so for those of you who don't know, who were just here for whatever reason, um, I'm going to be going through um, and kind of reviewing the original Bukowski chapbooks, even though I don't have them in my hand. Um, and the one we're doing today, Flower Fist and Bestial Whale, this one goes for a pretty penny on the webs, like two grand and up um, for like a little um, 30 page booklet. Flower, fe Flower Fest. Flower Fest, be there. Um, Flower Fest in Bestuelle um, was published in 1960 by Hearst Press. Um, Hearst was one of the many um, little magazines back in the day that um, had published Bukowski stuff. And um, all the poems <clears throat> that we're going to be going over today um, had appeared in other forms over the years and a lot of these are poems that um, were published in other magazines in the late 50s the earliest published poem in here is 1957 um, so that's pretty interesting okay so now if you want to read these poems um, all of them with the exception of one have been published elsewhere um, where people can actually get these. So the books you will need to read, no, it just feels like that, um, to read uh, the contents of this chapbook are found in these books here. So um, On Love has two of them. And this one actually um, is probably the newest Bukowski book that's been released. Um, this was, I believe, I don't know if this one came out or if On Drinking came out first. I don't know. It might be On Drinking, but that one has nothing to do with these. So anyway, so we have On Love. There's two in here. Um, one of them we'll get to, and I'll tell you about it then. <clears throat> uh, play the piano drunk like a percussionist. Learn until your fingers begin to bleed a bit. There's one in here. There is a multitude, and a lot of these early chapbooks, um, if you just wanted to grab one book to find what his early chapbooks were, were like, this is probably the book. Um, this is early poems from 1946 to 1966. Um, there are a lot of poems from here in here. Um, and then there's a couple in um, Burning in Water, Drowning in Flame, and a couple from his first um, big... Uh, not big, but I would say widely available, um, not limited edition book release, <clears throat> which is the days run away like wild horses over the hills. So, and if I'm not mistaken, we're either starting with that one or this one. Okay, we'll just, we'll put them in this order. That, that seems fine for right now. This is actually a very interesting way of going through Bukowski's catalog because for the most part, the Bukowski poetry books, um, like up until his death, and then even, I think afterwards, it, get, it even got worse, but um, the books are so big, like they're really chunky, like 300, 350 page um, books. So going through, it's almost like overkill when you're trying to, um, like not critique, but like just review and judge the work. So this is a really cool way of doing it. And the other thing I noticed, um, which we'll get to in a bit, um, when you have a small handful of poems that were all written um, around the same time, uh, you end up with a really interesting snapshot of Bukowski's life at that moment. 
So um, that's really interesting too. So the first one here, um, 10 lions and the end of the world. Um, this was originally, it was probably written in 1958. Um, it was originally published in the San Francisco Review number one in 1958. Um, and this um, is found on page 96 of the Rooming House Madrigals. Um, what did I say? Page 96. Um, one of these, I think it's when we get to the days run away, um, the page numbers for these things have all been messed up. Anyway, so um, this poem's pretty interesting um, as far as like a uh, first stab. So I'm assuming either Bukowski did this or the guy who put out Hearst did this um, where they're like, okay, if we had one chance to get people into Bukowski to see his whole outlook on everything and how um, poems from him would go, like where, what poem would be that poem out of this stack, let's say. And I think this is a pretty good, um, a pretty good pick for that. So um, this one's actually pretty short, so I'll just read it. <clears throat> 10 Lions in the End of the World. In a national magazine of repute, Yes, I was reading it. I saw a photograph of lions crossing a street in some village and taking their time. That's the way it should be. And someday when they turn out the lights and the whole thing's over, I'll be sitting here in the chalky smoke thinking of those ten damned, yes I counted them, lions blocking traffic while the roses bloom. We all ought to do that now while there's T-I-M-E time. One of the things that I have kind of given Bukowski shit for in his early work is, and it'll be evident as this goes, but again, this is my opinion. There's nothing that proves this anywhere. But um, the contradiction with Bukowski to me, is he thought he was the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be, okay? He thought he was the shit. But he constantly tried to impress the academic poetry world, the literati, as much as he would probably say he never did that, um... I really think he does. And um, with this poem here, um, there's one and I would have taken out. Um, but Jesus Christ, I'm not going to sit here and critique his shit like that. But um, while the roses bloomed, that line to me um, seems kind of out of place for this but i will say that this is a almost a trope through a lot of this early work and i think it'll be interesting to see when we get into the 80s if he's still doing this um i'm not sure if he does it like this and the only reason why i'm saying this is because um like he's already talked about like and when they turn out the lights and the whole thing's over meaning like when the world ends, basically, he'll be sitting there in the chalky smoke and um, thinking about those lions blocking traffic while the roses bloomed. Um, that line, to me, just screams like, look, I could write about um, depressing, pessimistic shit but, um, you know, while the roses bloomed, like I, I could do that stuff. And this isn't a very good example of that. We'll get into some more obvious signs of that, um, as we go. But, um, so that's that one poem. And I actually really do like that poem a lot. So there's that. Um, it's, uh, it's nice, short, gets to the point, perfect way to be introduced to him. 
Um, all the Yellow Flowers is the next one. Um, and this was probably written in 58 as well. It was in Compass Review number two in 1958. I hope I'm going to be able to find covers for all of these. I'd like to put them up um, so we can take a look at it. Um, so all the Yellow Flowers. That's in Days Run Away. Um, this poem's a bit longer. And... Um, I'm not going to read every poem to you guys because this video will be like the length of a motion picture, probably by um, Christopher Nolan or something like that. So I'm not going to do that. So All the Yellow Flowers. Um, this is another um, kind of trope. We'll get into with Bukowski. It's talking about a morbid thing. And he's talking about... Um, seeing them pull a body out um, through the window and there's like yellow flowers on them and there's a woman there who's upset and there's like the um, guy pushing the cart and so if you know about Bukowski's life there was a period where he lived across the street from um, what he called a stomach hospital and um, they would wheel bodies in and out all the time some like they would wheel people in who weren't dead yet and they would wheel people out who were dead, um, that whole thing. And there's a poem or a, no, it's a story um, called like the, the blonde mermaid of something or something like that. And in that one, um, two guys go and they steal a body from the place. Um, and if I recall... Um, in one of his books, it actually might just be a short story, um, when he talks about the 400-pound um, whore, 300-pound whore that he lost his virginity to, um, they talk about um, seeing the hospital and stuff. But anyway, so he's talking about this place, I believe, and um, he's trying to explain situation to the woman who's there and the woman is like singing a song that he like doesn't understand and she doesn't either want to understand what he's talking about or doesn't seem to understand what he's talking about and he doesn't understand what she's talking about so it's this whole thing where he either is saying that he can't be understood by women or he doesn't understand women um knowing what we know of Bukowski in general it's probably that he's not understood and because of that he can't understand anybody else stuff like that but um the morbidity that um him writing about something that is not pretty like the body outside that's um, very much his style. Now, another thing that we're going to see through this and through all of his work is um, his observational nature and his cataloging of events. And yes, he was a journalism student at, um, in college for a short period of time. And... Um, especially early on in his life, I believe he was probably very heavily influenced by Hemingway. And then I think as he got older, um, like a lot of people with Hemingway, the um, bloom falls off the rose and you're like, Hemingway, fuck me, dude. Ugh. You know, like kind of overrated. I don't know if that's his take at this moment in his life, but I think that's kind of how he felt later on, even though he did dig him at one point so anyway um the next one did i ever tell you um this was written around 1957 um this was in harlequin volume two number one um in 1957 now harlequin if you remember was a little magazine where he met barbara fry who was the editor of that magazine who he ended up marrying um she was the woman who couldn't turn her head like she had a fused um, neck 
<clears throat> or something like that. She couldn't turn her head. And she always felt like she was deformed. And he felt like he was so ugly that he was deformed. And through, she thought he was like the next big thing. And through her letters back and forth and her taking his poetry, um, she was talking about how no one would marry her. And he's like, well, hell, I'll marry you. You know, you can't be that bad. And um, then she's like, okay, cool, I'm coming. And he's like, oh, my God, what have I done? And they ended up married for, I think, two and a half years um, before she filed for divorce. So um, that's something. So this is in um, The Day's Runaway. Um, and this poem, it's probably about Jane. Um, who was probably the love of his life, who he um, uh, dedicated this book to. Uh, she died before any of his writing really did anything. Um, so this one is super long, but this is one of those um, kind of funny poems where um, it's a woman talking about all the men who she slept with and all the men that she's loved and who have loved her while he's just sitting there having to hear this and um, her reminiscing about all these great men that she's known over her life. Um, but, and that's the other thing too. If you have read a lot of Bukowski, a lot of the people that she talks about in this poem, you'll go, Oh my God, I remember that from this story. Or I remember that from, um, factotum or from post office, you know, like you could like go through the whole deal. Um, <clears throat> the next one, Dow Jones down, um, circa 1959. And this was, um, originally published in coastline number 12. Now this one, um, it says it was probably written in 1959. Um, I would guess that it was probably written in 1958 because he uses Chalky again. And this is kind of a stupid thing to point out, but I have noticed that when you read a poet's like collection of like, oh, these, I wrote a poetry book, here it is. Um, if the poems were written close together, a lot of times they use the same adjectives to describe things from poem to poem. And um, it's really jarring for me when I see that um, in, in a poet's book. And, like, amazing poets have done it. And I'm not saying that that's probably what they did. But as a writer, I know that if I've been drinking a little bit and I'm writing and I'll write something and then the next day I'll write something else and then I'll go and I'll look over it and I'll go, oh, my God, like, I basically said the same thing in both of these things here. Um, but so this one is in, um, the rooming house madrigals, but it's also in the, um, 1993 edition of run with the hunted. So if you have that, um, that actually has a few of these poems in there too. Um, but I had them in these books, so I didn't need to use that one, but yeah, this is another thing that he did, um, more so early on than he ever did later, which is where he, um, does this thing if you could look right here like he brings the line breaks over and stuff like that early on he tried to do stuff like that and i don't know and the only reason why i say it was probably him trying to fit in with the academics is because he didn't do that as much in his later work so i would just assume that the reason why he was doing it in the first place was to kind of show off a little bit um and then in this poem too it says how can we endure how can we talk about roses or verlaine okay now here is another bit where i feel like he does this stuff just to show people that he knows these things because and I might get a lot of heat from some Bukowski lovers for this. But if you look at how Bukowski talks about horse racing and the track and what great excruciating detail he goes into 
about horse racing and then go through his poems and when he talks about Verlaine or Brahms or um, any other kind of classical music or anything like that he doesn't go into the same detail with those things as he does with the horse racing and to me that's because he really has a passion for horse racing and when he brings up these um, more artsy people he brings them up so the academics understand that he's a learned man, which he has admitted many, many, many times that he's not. But he still does this stuff just to show them that he is familiar. He knows who these people are. But I don't think he knows them like he would want us to know that he knows them, if that makes sense. And I know he's read a lot of stuff, and especially early on in his life, and probably early in his writing career, too, he kept up. Like, that one, um, that first poem, like, he was reading a magazine of repute. I know. Like, he admits that he was doing these things. So... And a lot of times through his poems, he'll always kind of blame it on the woman he's living with at the time. Like, she has the fucking New Yorker. She has poetry. You know, like, all that shit. But anyway, so that's with that. Um, but this, again, um, kind of hits on his pessimism. And the chalkiness is... Um, this is where the stricken ba the stricken bagpipes blow upon the chalky cliffs. And this is like one of those, like, he's using alliteration. Like, he's, I feel like he's fucking trying, you know? And not in a way where it's beyond him to try, or um, below him to try, or even above him to try. Jesus Christ, I'm all over the place right now. But um, bagpipes blow chalky cliffs. Like, it's it's not what he ends up doing. And again, this is really early, early, early stuff. Um, and then we go to his wife, the painter. And um, this has been in a lot of stuff. And I've never really liked this one very much. Um but this one is probably what landed him the deal with Hearst putting out a chapbook of his because Hearst did a broadside of it in 1960. Um, it was probably written in 1959. <clears throat> it was in Coffin Number 1 in 1964. It's in The Days Run Away. Um, it's in Run With the Hunted. And it's in The Pleasures of the Damned. So it is one of those um, more famous Bukowski poems. Um, and I don't like it because, and this is probably those times when, like, I don't know if Bukowski knew when he sat down to write, he was going to be writing a poem or if he was going to be writing a story. But um, I'm just, like, just looking at it, this right here. It just, it it doesn't look appealing when you look at it. So that puts me right off, right off the bat. Um, and it's like two pages of that. It looks more like a, um, a play that you're reading kind of thing. And the other thing in here, um, and this again is his ridiculous observation. He's basically talking about, um, it's him and his wife at home having a conversation of some sort um, and him, again, being misunderstood and doesn't understand what's going on. But he'll, like, go by and, like, this line right here, he starts, it's basically the spine of a book that he sees on the table. And then later, um, there's another book that he sees and then another book that he sees. And he doesn't tell you he's seeing this. Just in the middle of the talk, he throws this in there. And, um, like, I these are like a Dartmouth College, uh, Baker Library book, Christ Destroying the Cross. Um, and then we have a, Paris, a book from Paris um, and another, a Bibliothèque Nationale. I don't know how to read any of this. 
Crawl. Paris Glavi. Okay, like, so it's just this, oops. Um, it's this thing where he's talking about a situation that's going on um, with him and a woman inside of their place of residence. And it's very mundane and very trite. Okay. But then he just throws these books in there, like almost like the name of the book, uh, the not the catalog number, but like the publisher and all this stuff. Almost to me, it's, it's almost as if he's showing people like, yeah, this is how I live and I live in squalor, but these are the books that are around me. So don't give me any of your shit that I'm not good enough. And I really feel like a lot of his early stuff is just trying to show people that he's good enough to be there, that he's good enough to be at the dance kind of thing. Um, but the one thing I did like in here, and I don't know if this was um, what he was going for. And again, I don't like it. I think he shines when he's writing his poetry in first person. And this is in third person, so not my favorite. Um, but again, again, the poem is called His Wife, the Painter. Um, and what I got from this is that she painted a, a landscape or something that he could also see. And the way she painted it is not the way that he sees it. So in his mind, she's a liar for painting it and have it not look as dreadful and full of gloom as he sees the same outside. So that little bit, and there's a lot in there just to nail that little bit right there. I, I think that's fucking brilliant. Okay, so the next one we have here, I Cannot Stand Tears, circa 1958. It was in the San Francisco Review number one from 1958. Um, this one has been in A Terror Street in Agony Way, the audio version. Um, it Catches My Heart in Its Hands, which was um, the first Lujan Press book that they put out. Um, this was also in um, The Penguin Modern Poets. I think it's number 13. Um that was like the first big, that's the book that made him, his inclusion in that book made him like a, a big deal on the poetry scene. And that was in 1968. Um, it's in a Bukowski sampler from 1969 and in um, Rooming House. Now, this poem is um, very strange. I'll just, I'll just read it to you. Um, I cannot stand tears. There were several, several hundred fools around the goose who broke her leg, trying to decide what to do. When the guard walked up, pulled out his cannon, and the issue was finished. Except for a woman who ran out of a hut, claiming he killed her pet. But the guard rubbed his straps and told her, Kiss my ass, take it to the president. The woman was crying, and I could not stand tears. I folded my canvas and went further down the road. The bastards had ruined my landscape. Now, what's strange about this is that I don't know if the bastards in general, all the people there, because what it sounds like he's doing, he was there drawing a picture or painting something, um, and he was painting this landscape, and all this fucking shit happened, and he was fine with all the shit happening. The goose with the broken leg, the, the gawkers, the people not knowing what to do, the guy with the gun shooting the fucking bird, putting it out of its misery... All that shit was fine, but as soon as some, uh, as soon as a woman started crying, he had a problem with it and had to get up and leave. Now I don't know if this is because he sees a crying woman as a form of manipulation, or if he just really can't stand tears as just a sign of weakness. Um, he does talk about. Um, I think both of those actually could be true because he um, has talked about like having guts and like um, not showing any form of weakness like himself. Like he never wanted to ever do that. Um, so I don't know, like it could be either one, but I could also see him thinking, um, especially since 
the women he surrounded himself with were um, basically prostitutes who would um, use whatever they needed to use to take advantage of a man or take advantage of a situation or take advantage of money. So I could see him also being like, oh yeah, a crying woman, that's just like, she's after something. And it's not good. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just trying to get to his bit. Now, this next one um, is a little harder to find out. And um, I think I've seen it, so I think it's okay here. But um, the next poem is, I Taste the Sweet Ashes of Your Death. Now, that poem with that title can only be found in this book, okay, in the Flower Fist and Bestial Will. Um, but if you look up, I Taste the Ashes of Your Death, um, that's been in a bunch of stuff. So I'm going to assume that the title just got changed a little bit. So this was in Nomad Volume 1 in 1959 and Promotion Volume 1 in 1959. This is in um, The Days Run Away, um, Run With the Hunted, and it's also in On Love. Um, and so I'll look at it in that one because that's a smaller book and I think um, all the on love poems are kind of on the same page. Yeah, and this poem here, um, I want to read it to you. I This is very, and some people might argue with me, this is very unlike the stuff that you would normally see him write. And I honestly, this goes back to the same thing, like trying, trying to prove something. So I taste the ashes of your death. The blossoms shake sudden water down my sleeve, sudden water, cool and clean, as snow, as the stem-sharp swords go in against your breast, and the sweet, wild rocks leap over and lock us in. The ending of this poem is very reminiscent of other stuff that he's written, um, other short stories, um, and stuff like that. But all of this um, is just so unlike. It's probably, most people would probably say, like, who aren't Bukowski fans, would probably read that and go, oh my gosh, that's a great poem. That's really good. Um, but that is so, like, vague for Bukowski. Super vague for Bukowski. Love is a piece of paper torn to bits, circa 1959. This was in Coastlines, um, 196 or Coastlines number 14 in 1960. Um, he's done audio recordings of this, so it's in the 90 Minutes in Hell, 70 Minutes in Hell, um, Terror Street and Agony Way, um, and it's probably all three of those are probably the same recording actually. Um, it's also in It Catches um, My Heart in Its Hands, um, Rooming House, uh, Madrigals, and On Love. So let me look at this in here and see if I could. Yeah, this one I'm not going to read to you. It's um, kind of weird. Like he's using a, um, a ship on um, a stormy sea kind of as a metaphor for something that's going on. But then I feel like he drops the metaphor and then just is talking about like normal stuff at that point. So it, it's kind of a strange poem. Not It's not one of my favorites. I actually love the title more than I love the poem. But um, the next one we're getting to here, No Charge. This is, um, again, circa 59 and coastlines number 14 from 1960. Um, he has audio recordings of this on a bunch of stuff. It's in It Catches um, My Heart in Its Hands, a Bukowski sampler, um, bur uh, Burning in Water, Drowning in Flame. Now, this one has one of these great lines that um, is in his stuff. What page does this say? It's on 20? Ah. <sighs> This is a good one. 
I'll just read this one for you because it's pretty short. Uh, no charge. This babe in the grandstand with dyed red hair kept leaning her breasts against me and talking about Gardena poker parlors. But I blew smoke into her face and told her about a Van Gogh exhibition that I'd seen up the hill. And that night when I took her home, she said, Big Red was the best horse she'd ever seen until I stripped down. Though I think the Van Gogh thing, they charged 50 cents. So, um, this is, I don't want to say like a really famous poem of his, but again, we're doing this thing where he is painting himself into a situation where he's down with the low lifes at the racetrack, okay? And he's fine with that. But he wants her to know that um, he's like a, a cut above, you know? Like, yeah, we could go to a poker parlor, but we could also go see this amazing Van Gogh exhibition. Um, and then at the end of the day, he ended up just um, going home to her place or whatever and giving her the long, hard ride. But that line where um, she said Big Red was the best horse she'd ever seen until I stripped down. Um, that's... That's fucking classic. Um, I, that's just a really fucking cool line. Um, and she didn't charge him, says the title. And this is the one thing I like. The title says no charge. So um, probably she was a lady of the night. He um, had his cake and he ate it too. And she didn't charge him for it because he was the best horse she had ever seen. Um, so the Van Gogh thing was cool, but they charged 50 cents for that. This, also cool, was for free. So that's just um, a funny little bit where, but again, we're doing this thing where like the art world and the racetrack world. Um, yeah, it's, it's so weird because like so much of his life he would be like, you know, I'm just like a horse player who like happens to write poetry but he really, really wanted that acceptance. It's so it's so weird. It's so weird. And like maybe you do that thing, thou protest too much, kind of thing. But whatever. Um, On a night you don't sleep. This is uh, circa nineteen fifty seven. It's in Harlequin, Volume Two, Number One, nineteen fifty seven. And the only other place you could find this is in um, Rooming House. And um, this poem's okay. But um, this is one of those things he does, and he did it in the first poem in here, where he basically is, he'll be describing what he's doing, and then the next line will be what other people are doing at that exact moment, what things are happening over here at that exact moment. And um, just the... I don't know if that's a juxtaposition or anything like that, but like, I mean, I guess it kind of is like if he's talking about like, he's watching people walk on the beach while the president is doing some other thing. Um, and again, that is a lot to do with class, like what different classes of people are doing. But on, on a night where he can't sleep, he's just like wandering around and seeing all these people who have their own lives their own worries, their own problems, they're all doing their own different things, um, oblivious that he's even watching them do the things that they're doing. So it goes back to that um, observation and cataloging events and stuff like that. Um, regard me, this is a very strange poem to have in here too, considering what I was just saying. Um, this one was in Nomad Volume 1 from 1959. Um, it's on the Terror Street CD, and I can't wait to, to get to Terror Street because that's such an interesting story if you don't know it. Um, so when we get to that, that'll be fun. Um, it Catches My Heart in its Hands and in Rooming House. So this is on um, page 176, and I just want to go over this one because it's kind of strange. Like, I knew we would be talking about 
his desire to be accepted. But, um, like, I didn't think of how much we would be talking about that. And now this poem. So, regard me, this little bit at the bottom, the end of it. Regard me, even as dead, more alive than many of the living. And regard me as I fumble with flat breasts. Regard me as nothing, so we may have peace and forget. So he kind of goes through this thing where um, he wants to be regarded. He wants people to know who he is. He wants that recognition. He wants that. Um, but then as the poem goes, it's almost like he wants to talk himself out of that, or at least come off like he's talking himself out of that. So um, like regard me even as dead, even though I'm more alive than the living, um, and regard me as nothing. So, you know, we could just forget that this whole thing happened. And it's like, who are you trying to prove? Like, like, who are you trying to like make believe that kind of thing? I don't know. Um, the, it's the whole, his self-importance undercut with his self-deprecating manner, which is the contradiction that, um, will probably, I think that through line will go through his whole career, um, uh, more so than any other ones. So in Soiree, um, is the next poem from 1959. It was in Epos volume 10, number four. This is also in Rooming House. Um, and it, this is more um, paranoia, fearing, not being able to fit in, and um, relishing the death that will eventually come to him. Now, the one poem that is not in any of his published works um, is some notes of Dr. Clarston. And um, there's, if you're interested in Bukowski's stuff, a lot of the information I got, um, I got from Bukowski.net. It's probably one of the best fan sites I've ever seen for any artist of any kind. Um, and I would, I don't know if the site's still there, but I would like put a close second would be um, Mazzy Star Boulevard. If um, that site still exists um, about 20 years ago, that was the best fan site I'd ever seen in my life for Massey star obviously um but anyway moving right along but so this poem isn't anywhere but um there is a picture of it either i guess it would have to be from purse number two um so i got this off of the bukowski forums from bukowski.net so i will post that here so you can take a look at it and read it um it's not very good it's not it's okay. It's not one of my favorites. I do like the drawing of the line. That's that's clever. Um, this may just be a dig at um, those people who like go through something horrific in their life, um, usually with a woman or a man, and then decide that they're a poet because they. Um, wrote their feelings down about it. And someone said, oh my gosh, that's really good. And so they write um, because they're miserable. And then as soon as their life starts picking up again, they have nothing to write about. So they are no longer a poet. Um, so I'm probably pretty sure that especially Bukowski being a poet and being in poet circles-ish, um, ran into people like that all the time. So um, I kind of think that's more of what this is, more like a, a satire. Um, then we have The Day It Rained at the L.A. County Museum from 1959. This was released in Nomad Volume 5 slash 6. I don't know if that means both or what, uh, but 1960. And then it was also in Florida Education in um, Florida Education, Volume 42, Number 9, from May 1965. This was also included in the Penguin Modern Poets. It Catches My Heart in Its Hands, a Bukowski sampler, and Burning in Water, Drowning in, for, for, drowning in Flame. And this one here, um, 
wanting to remember things exactly how it is and how it was. Um, that's really important to him. Like the honesty in reporting, I guess you could say, through his poetry. Um, not church and everything up. And I feel like he felt his contemporaries, um, whether poets or painters or whatever, wouldn't show what things really were. They just showed what they hoped things would be or what they wanted things to be. And him being more of a realist was like, no, you show things how they are. There's probably some people who don't like that part of his work. Uh, next, we have the paper on the floor um, from 1959. This was another Hearst broadside in 1964. It was in coffin number one in 1964. Um, in Fire Station, which was another chapbook of his in 1970. Uh, Play the Piano Drunk, um, page 30. Now, this one here... Um, it's really weird because um, I'll get to it in a little bit, but in um, Trace number 40, which was another little magazine, they did a review of Flower Fist and Bestial Whale in it. And they got something very different than from what I got from it. Um, but again, it's probably because I was looking at the art as a whole, whereas they were looking at um, the art from the point of view of the artist. The paper on the floor, um, it's kind of this, I'm, I'm not a huge lover of this either, but um, the thing that kind of hits is that all this stuff's going on um, with him and a woman in a house or whatever, in an apartment, and he sees a newspaper like under the chair and it's the funny pages and um, the funny pages are still telling bad jokes and doing the thing they're going to do, even though they know um, that they're going to be in the trash can tomorrow. And so like the thing I got from this was like the art is important to the character's in the funny pages, because if no one reads the characters in the funny pages, if no one wants to know what's going on in that, um, and nobody cares, then what is the art for? So the um, comics on that newspaper need to be seen and heard for their own artistic benefit as much as he, an artist, a poet, needs to be heard and understood for his own artistic benefit if that makes any sense and um i don't know if that's the um view that most people would take from this but that's what i got out of it and then finally the last poem here the twins um this is from 59 as well um the galley sale review volume one number four in 1959 father poems march 1981 south bay volume four number eight november of 81 um, this was in It Catches My Heart in Its Hands, Penguin Modern Poets, Burning in Water, Drowning in Flame, Essential Bukowski, The Terror Street CD, um, and The Poetry of Charles Bukowski from 2008. So this is like one of those ones that has done the rounds on his stuff. And this is a strange way to end this, where we're doing a very true and honest poem about him and um, it's about the death of his father and um, not really knowing exactly like I feel like he did he didn't understand what his part in his father's death and right afterwards should be and he's kind of just like meandering through the house um, looking at stuff, not knowing if he should like make the bed. He's going to try on a suit, flaps his arms around in it. Nothing makes, he's just like, mm, I don't know. And everything else 
like outside there's fruit growing on the trees the rosebuds are ready to be planted like life continues when somebody dies and i think a lot of people that is a fucking hard pill to swallow to know that like you could die and the rest of the world will not skip a beat like everything continues like we are so fucking temporary and everything and the world is very fucking temporary um but i think this is as real as he gets and all of this stuff because a lot of this poems in this book are like look at me look at me i matter i'm as good as you are um all this other shit and then this one it just gets down to the fucking like brass tacks of him not knowing what his role is in this play of his father's death like he doesn't he doesn't exactly know let me know down below if you like this Thing I'm doing here with the Mikowski chat books. Um, I'm really digging it. Um, I can't wait to get to the next one. And the next one of these I'll do is also going to be from 1960. And it's uh, a signature of Charles Mikowski is the name of the chat book. So um, yeah, that'll be coming up. But yeah, let me know down below what you thought of this. Um, do you have any different takes on the poems in here that I did? Um, I'd love to hear about that. And, um, do you have any of these chat books? If you do like send me some pics, um, so I could be super jealous. And if you want to sell them to me, name your price. And I will tell you that I don't have that much and I will try to undercut you because I don't have that kind of scratch. Okay. So anyway, so until next time, take care, everybody.